Uh, all right, here we are at Haystack Rock. We're gonna start here in a couple of minutes. Um, with us today, we are very socially education volunteer coordinator. We have a special guest, Miss Margaret Minnick. She's here from the Friends of Cape Falcon. Um, and then one of our super volunteers, Claudine Wren. She is a New Dubron queen. So, and then I'm Kari, I'm back here. I'll be filming and um, talking about seabirds a little bit later. So we'll just give a couple more minutes um, and then we're gonna start with our education coordinator, Miss Lisa. She's got a good lesson for you today. We are on the beach here in Cannon Beach. It's pretty quiet. Not very many people. But it's a lovely day. Alright, I think it's time to get started. All right, everybody, welcome to Haystack Rock. Here's Miss Lisa, I'm turning it over. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Haystack Rock. And as Corey said, I'm Lisa Habaker. I'm the education and the volunteer coordinator for this program. I have worked for the city of Cannon Beach and this program for 18 years. So welcome. Um, it's not raining today, so you get to do the most exciting thing ever, virtual tide pooling. And today, I'm gonna start off with anemones. So you probably are wondering why I have this kid's toy. This kid's toy is a perfect representation of a close-up and an anemone. Can we all say anemone really fast? Because I think I'm gonna get tongue-tied. And so it's completely, let's pretend, it's closed up. And if we come over here to the rock, you can see how they're not only tightly packed in here, but they are closed up just like my toy. And I'm gonna show you the proper way to touch anemones. Now, first and foremost, we're not gonna be touching our faces right now during this pandemic. But if your hands are completely washed with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, or hand sanitized, how we touch our eyes very gently is how you want to touch animals here in the tide pools. So anemones, they're not plants, even though they look like a kind of a funky looking flower. They're actually, these are colonies of animals and these animals are soft bodied. So poking at them is going to cause harm. And first of all, I don't know if Kari can zoom in but right in the very center, it kind of looks like a belly button. And this one, it's fun because it's pooping. So uh, right in the center, <laughs> really, it's not only its mouth, but it's also its bum. So food comes in and it's called a blind digestive tract. So the animal absorbs as many nutrients as possible and then expels it or poops from the same location. So what you don't want to be doing when you're visiting, I'm sure some of you out there have poked at them and watched water go squirting out. I'll talk about that in a second. But most importantly, you're poking your finger in their bum. And as we all know, it's not polite to poke animals or other people on their backsides. So, an anemone, as part of their adaptation, when they're out of the water, remember the tide is out for six hours. So between high and low is a little over six hours. So when they are out of the water, they're holding their breath, much like you are when you're swimming. You have to hold your breath because as far as I know, we can't breathe underwater yet. And so it's really important that we don't disturb them 
when they're out of the water. These are aggregated anemones. So when they're underneath, let's see if we can get a good view. I should have done that. Oh, right here. They open up. So the water comes over. They're opportunistic feeders. So their tentacles, this is super cool. Their tentacles have sticky barbs that have a neurotoxin on them. So if you've ever touched the outer tentacles, again, real gently, remember like touching your eye, you don't wanna poke at them. They're gonna feel kind of sticky. And those are the stinging cells attaching to our skin. But our skin's too tough, so it can't penetrate it. But of course, you don't wanna stick your finger in your nose, your eyes or your mouth afterward. Again, you wanna be super hygienic and make sure you wash your hands but this is how they go after their prey because they're not swimming after their prey. They're waiting till their prey comes to them. And if an unsuspecting fish swims by and the anemone can reach out, they'll attach those stinging cells, those barbs, harpoon-like with that neurotoxin. Fish becomes paralyzed and then the animal is gonna close up. It's gonna take a while and then push it down into its blind digestive tract, digest everything, and then poop out whatever nutrients it no longer needs. Pretty cool. So we wanna be really respectful of anemones. Um, what is her purpose? Everything has a purpose here at Haystack Rock or any place that you visit. And it's important because I failed to tell you the most important thing. And that is when you visit Haystack Rock, we have a special etiquette here. And our etiquette here, not only are we a national wildlife refuge for our nesting seabirds, but we're a state protected marine garden. And that means we don't, we would like you not to trample and crush our animals in the habitat, especially on these rocks. You look at this and you're like, well, it's just a rock. But if you look carefully underneath all the sand, our baby anemones, algae, snails, and sometimes underneath the algae will be baby snails hiding out. So it's really important to understand, yes, this is a rock, but it's a habitat. And this particular habitat is incredibly fragile. So we need you to stay on the sand, respect the signs not to go into the refuge, and and enjoy your tide pooling um, with respect for keeping the animals safe and you safe because if you're standing on these rocks, what's gonna happen? You're gonna slip and fall and we don't want anybody to get hurt visiting us here at Haystack Rock. Um, the next thing um, about etiquette is that not every tide pool areas have the same special rules. Further south, they encourage you to walk on the rocks, but their rocks don't have exactly what we do. They have urchins in these little special crevices that the urchin has created. So as you're walking, they're cushioned in that depression. So personally me, I still stay on the sand because I don't want to slip and fall. Plus I don't want to hurt any animals inadvertently. Um, the next thing, about um, Haystack Rock, if we stand up. I'm pretty, I'm five foot two. Our rock is 235 feet high. Um, currently, the circumference around is approximately a thousand feet. And what's really cool is this was a lava flow, one of seven that made it to the ocean. And they think the original height was a geologist thing was approximately a thousand feet high. I'm not sure about that, but I think pretty much that's accurate. And this all happened about 16 million years ago. So definitely not in our lifetime. The rock will still be standing in our lifetime, but there is a lot of erosion happening. And we'll try to point some things out on the north side that just happened recently. We see rock falls constantly on the face and on the north side um, and here on the main wall. 
So another reason, if we have an area closed, it's gonna be for the protection of you, so falling rock, or, or for a nesting seabird. So, um, let's talk about sea stars. I don't have any sea stars right here, but we can go see them on the north side after we hear from Margaret and from Claudine. But I'm gonna tell you how a sea star eats. And they're super cool. Let's go over to my little fun box. Again, we're walking on the sand. Here, I have some props, so sea stars, and we all know about sea stars, and Carly's going to talk about, um, during her citizen science talk, about our sea star survey and why we do our sea star survey. So, one of the important things about sea stars is they're a keystone predator, and sea stars love California mussels, our particular sea stars, ochres. Um, so, the way they eat is sea stars can't move when they're out of the water. They're stuck in whatever position. So for our brains, we think they might be dead. They're not. They're still alive. They just have to wait until the tide comes. And so once the tide comes in, they are around their favorite mussel beds. And so they use a pressure system around the mussel. And all they have to do is it'll open it just a tiny little bit. Once they have it open just a slight bit, they insert a portion of their stomach. Their stomach is loaded, located right in the very center. From here, with that portion of the stomach comes all their digestive enzyme, and it kills the muscle. It makes it into this shape, so to speak. And then the sea star stomach comes all the way through and scoops it all out and you know how long that generally takes? Not a couple of hours, not a few hours. It takes anywhere from 24 to 48 hours to consume one muscle. How crazy is that? I mean, can you imagine sitting at your table for an entire meal for one day or two days? That's crazy. But again, you have to remember as they're eating, the tide is going out, the tide's coming back in, the tide's going back out and coming back in. So, there you go. They are, um, they're gonna stay by their muscles, which to them is the all-you-can-eat buffet. They will eat barnacles, and barnacles are related to crabs. And yesterday we posted on Facebook um, some pictures, uh, or a picture of a barnacle molt. And the molt, because they're related to crabs, it's her foot or kind of like their foot. Barnacles spend their entire life upside down. So can you imagine doing everything just with this appendage? Because your head is glued here. So either to a muscle, to another barnacle, to their species that attach themselves to whales and to boats. I mean, crazy as it is, this is a living organism that use is a filter feeder just like the muscle and gathers everything with this foot, this siri, this um, this plume to gather all the detritus and plankton in. So we have that. And then let's see. Oh, my next favorite creature, and I'll see if Claudine can point one out, the live one is a chitin. And Corey's gonna talk about birds. And our favorite shore bird, the oyster catcher, check this out. The oyster catcher loves to eat chitons. And these are the skeletons. When they break apart after being washed by the waves, they become little butterfly wings and I don't oh there we go so these are great finds on the beach and these are the plates of the chitin that break apart after the strong muscle around it has disintegrated and chitons are grazers and they have teeth made of magnetite so if we were to take while the animal is living um, and 
we shouldn't be doing this. Um, but if you took a magnet, it would stick to them. Um, so they, and this one's kind of because it's breaking apart, but to protect their soft underside, because remember, like a snail, they have a big foot and they roll up like a roly poly to protect that soft underside and hopefully don't get, become breakfast for the oyster catcher. But we do want them to be breakfast for the oyster catcher. Um, so these are awesome finds. If you ever see them on the beach, they're called butterfly wings. And you can see that. Yeah. So we have many species of chitin here. We have mossy, hairy, lined chitin, and they all eat specific things. The lined chitin prefers to feed off of the coralline algae, so they turn the kind of purplish. Maybe we'll find some on the coralline algae. Um, so far, let's see, what else can we see real quick? Oh, um, I think that Miss Margaret is going to be able to find you some shore crabs today when she's going to talk about zonation. So how about if we head over there? and talk to Margaret and see all the cool stuff that she can find. And again, remember, we gotta be really careful. Look at the birds. Look at the MERS. It's mesmerizing. <laughs> or mer merizing. <laughs> all right, let's go see Margaret. Okay. So again, we're gonna walk on this hand because we don't wanna disturb the habitat. And I will let everybody watching know, um, we have Francis, one of our amazing interpreters, um, on Facebook too. So if you have any questions, you can ask in the comments um, and she will get to them. If she doesn't, we'll also have time for questions at the end. So just definitely. Okay, so we're going out on the sand so you always want to be looking where you're stepping always and Margaret's gonna talk about zonation maybe find us some cool shore crabs and do you see a chitin over here I have it but you look for one okay while I chat about zonation all right all right we'll turn it over to Miss Margaret Hi. I'm Margaret from Cape Falcon Marine Reserve, which is just south of here, and Atra. And, um, and actually, I, uh, we work together on a lot of things, so including citizen science that Kari's going to talk about, and things like that. So, donation. So you might notice, looking at this wall, if we can do like a scan, Kari, from top to bottom. Sure. Up here, there's just like little hard crusty barnacles mostly let me know if you see anything else Kari. little snail down here you get some bigger barnacles oh but don't forget these guys also a few gooseneck barnacles which are my favorite after the short crumbs a little lower we get mussels a whole bunch of mussels and then down and then down below you'll see all the soft animals like the sea anemones. Now, why would that be? And why would there be such an abrupt line here at the bottom of the mussels? Well, it's because of the tides. So on the Pacific coast, there are two high tides and two low tides every day, almost all the time. Because <laughs> there's a little more than 12 hours between high tides and between low tides. So they get a little later every day. So some days don't have, don't have to, but anyway, most of the time they have to. And the animals up here, this is the area where they're very rarely submerged. So the high tide line is up here 
and these barnacles are really, really hard. And the reason, well, their hardness, <laughs> their hardness helps them retain moisture on their soft bodies inside of the shell while the tide is out. So looking around here, you'll see everything is, has a hard shell. These goose barnacles have hard shells. There's all these teeny, teeny, tiny barnacles here and they can survive up here. And then if you go down lower, the mussels, they need a little more, um, a little more time in the water. So this is the line, I believe of the average high tide or the mean higher high water. And so they are regularly getting inundated with water. And when they're inundated with water, they can eat, which is super important. And then they can also wet their gills on the body that's inside this shell. It's kind of hard to imagine sometimes, I mean, unless you eat them, that, <laughs> that there's a body inside, but there is. Um, and when, when the water comes in, they open up a little bit and filter feed. I think Lisa talked a little bit about that in the first set, set of, uh, first session there. And then you also notice in this area, a lot of, a lot of animals can live here. Because if you look, there's animals on top of animals. So on this mussel here, for example, there's all these tiny barnacles and there's a gooseneck barnacle in there. Like who knows what he's even attached to, it's crazy. And there's just things upon things and they're all looking for a good spot to attach. And then some are looking for a little bit of a quieter spot to hang out in. And that's where we'll find our shore crabs. So if you come over here, there's a little one right here. So the crabs also need a certain amount of moisture to breathe. They need the moisture on their gills, but they can spend quite a bit of time out of the water. So there's one hiding in there. There's another one here where you can kind of see his top and see more of the shape. Where is he? He's right in there. There he is. Yeah. And these guys are just hiding out right now, maybe because I'm here. They tend to know when people are nearby and they hide, but you sometimes see them wandering along amongst the mussels and other barnacles, picking up little tiny pieces of food and putting them in their mouth. They just like pick up, like just kind of like the little leftovers, whatever, and munch on them, it's pretty cute. So back to zonation though, you'll see there's this really abrupt line at the bottom of the mussels. And that's the area where the sea stars can survive, can, can be out of the water or in the water long enough. They have enough time basically to eat the mussels. So Lisa, a few minutes ago, described how long it takes for a sea star to eat a mussel when they're putting their stomach inside there and digesting it. What did she say, like 24 hours? 24 to 48. Wow. So this is the area where the sea stars are actually going to get like 24 to 48 hours of time to eat those mussels. So lo and behold, there's not really any mussels down there. <laughs> but they can sometimes come up onto here and get some, but it's just the lower ones. So on this lower level, you see all the squishy animals. They're the ones who need a lot more time in the water, like more time in the water than that. All the little squishy friends. Poop. Fun to poke. It's fun to just touch them a little bit gently on the side and see them move. Uh, not too much though. Don't want to stress them out. But down here, it's a little bit more of a, rather than like survival of the animals that are best adapted to spend more time out of the water and in the sunlight. And it's more competition, like predation down here. So you do kind of see a little bit more variety instead of like this huge mass of mussels like you do on the upper top, on the upper level. Got some snails. Yeah. I've seen a lot of pretty snails this morning. Oh, I saw something really cool over here. So one interesting thing about tide pools, among the many interesting things, is that sort of the, the pieces that are left behind by dead animals are often used by other animals. So it's actually really important even to leave like vacant vacant shells around and I noticed over here there's a barnacle shell 
So if you look at these guys, they've got, you know, the little barnacle animal in there, like with kind of that beak down in there. That's where the barnacle animal lives. These are alive. But if you go over here, you look in this broken barnacle shell and the one next to it that's still not broken, there are sea anemones living inside there. So those are kind of like safe little crevices where they can get a little bit of a respite from the waves, even though they're adapted to the waves, and have a little safe place to live. So you'll see things like that happening in a million different ways in a tide pool. You look at this wall, you see a million things like that happening. It's super cool and interesting to find those. There are some more pretty snails. Do you know the names of these snails, Kari? Um, Winkles? Yeah. One time I saw a purple one, which was really pretty. Oh, look at this nice striped one. Should we talk about citizen science a little bit? Sure, go for it. Okay. So at Haystack Rock, we do a variety of um, citizen science projects. Uh, one of the big ones is the Sea Star Survey. So there's a plot um, on the north side and one on the south side where every month during really nice low tides, um, the brave people come out here early in the morning, i.e. Lisa and Kari, and, <laughs> and count the, the sea stars that they see in that plot. So it's basically like rocky areas. Um, that they're looking at and they'll see they'll count like how many baby ones there are how many big ones there are and then that way they know kind of how the family the population of sea stars is doing which is pretty cool and it's pretty important because a few years ago um, a lot of them died off from something called sea star wasting syndrome and we are seeing them come back but kind of slowly and um, some places more than in others so that's one thing they do and that is actually it's part of a study that is done at a whole bunch of sites up and down the coast from California up to Washington and all that data is integrated together so that the scientists can get a picture of what's happening on the whole whole Pacific coast and then they also do um, bird surveys so there is a pair of nesting black oyster catchers I heard you're gonna talk about birds yeah, I think we'll talk about seabirds and shorebirds and seabirds and shorebirds. Yeah, so there are there's a there's one where they monitor the nests. What do you see over there? <laughs> Guillemots. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice to see all the birds back. Yeah, we can hear them. Yeah, so there are um, a variety of uh, of uh, citizen science projects that happen here on the coast related to birds. Um, mostly related to uh, watching their nesting and seeing if they're successful and then reporting disturbances. So um, sometimes it'll be like disturbances by uh, bigger birds, predators that come to eat them or just harass them. <laughs> um, and then sometimes human disturbance as well, which it's important to be careful, especially during nesting season, not to disturb nesting birds. And um, then there's also a pelican survey, which basically just surveying how many pelicans you see at a particular location. So if anyone on here today is interested in those, most of them aren't really happening right now, but they will again soon. So always email Haystack Rock Awareness Program to find out more about that. Excellent. Yeah. Um, why don't we go find Claudine and look at some nudibranchs? Oh my God, that sounds amazing. So amazing. So um, I'll let you guys look at the beach while I walk because it's a little bit more entertaining than my face. But um, if anybody's just logging on, we're down here at Haystack Rock today. We're going through our field trip program just virtually because of COVID-19. But we hope that we are able to teach you guys some stuff today. So what we're going to go learn about are new to Bronx. Well, before that, we're going to show you some things that they eat. Here, first of all, let's go back to those chitons. Here, I've got a chiton hiding out. Have Kari squeeze in here. Do you see the chiton? Do you see the eight plates? It's surrounded by a muscular girdle, and the and it's the foot of 
the chitin, and the grazer. So they have home pastures that they stay within. They're also nocturnal. So you see them moving at night, cruising around their home pasture. Um, again, remember if they become detached, they roll up like a roly poly. And, and super cool that Kari just saw, we have a baby sea star hiding out in this little crevice. So one of the important things when you're coming to Haystack Rock, you know, you're kind of overwhelmed, first of all, there if this is. is your first time visiting. And we ask that you stay in one spot. Find a rock, stare at it for about 10 to 15 minutes because all of a sudden different species start popping up. Like being able to look in the nooks and crannies to find juvenile animals such as this sea star. Um, so going, so we were also talking about the mussels. And what's really important about the mussels is how do they, how do they form this big group? They have a specialized gland inside their body called the vessel, and it makes these threads, the beard we scrub off if you happen to like mussels. Now remember, the mussels at Haystack Rock, even though they're super big, they're all protected, so they cannot be collected here. So they all have to remain here. And again, if you're visiting a particular That's site, different. always check rules and regulations about that site. Don't make an assumption, well, I did it at this other place. Guess what? Every place has different rules and different etiquette. So here, all our muscles and animals are protected. And if you look carefully, those bissel threads are hanging here and they're made of protein. And once they hit seawater, they harden up. And that's how they attach themselves to each other to the substrate. You can see this is where a muscle was once attached. Check out all those threads. You can see it was on their shell. See how, look, I'm tugging on it and it's not coming off. Now remember, this is a huge dynamic area. Waves are big. You not only have huge waves coming in and out, especially during the winter time. Has anyone ever been storm watching here? Holy cow, huge waves. But you get debris, like logs, other rocks coming through. Maybe another group of mussels got washed off and they're coming through. So it's completely dynamic here. So they had to have a strong adaptation to be able to hold on tightly. Um, if they become detached and they're nearby a substrate, they can go ahead and reattach. We've had mussels that we've collected for an aquaria program for a field trip that it started to attach in our temporary aquaria. And that's only in a, just a short amount of time. Um, and then we have a special find in here also, besides a baby sea shark, but we have a calcareous tube worm. And unfortunately, we can't see the plume. The plume's hiding. It's tucked inside that coil and it's rock hard, made of calcium carbonate. So one of the other things I wanted to point out before we go say, um, listen to Claudine talk about our favorite sea slugs. Um, what they eat. Again, we have to be really careful where we're stepping. Prints in the sand. And down here, um, I have a patch of hydroids that some in <laughs> Opalus and Nudibons have already eaten. But this is what one of their favorite things is to eat hydroids. And the hydroids are related to jellies to anemones, they all have stinging cells, and coral. So these guys, this isn't a good patch to really show, but they look like um, the trees from the Lorax. They have these orangish puff balls on top. So they're called tubularia, is their scientific name for that particular hydrate. Plus, do you see the red patches in here? That sponge. And we have sea slugs that only eat sea sponge. 
And with that, what else can we find real quick? Oh, we had eggs right here. Mm -hmm. So these are sea slug eggs and they come from Adorid because they're kind of um, coiled up like this in ribbons. And that would be Adorid that laid those eggs. Probably a barnacle eating Dorid, but I unfortunately wasn't able to find one in here. They're super tiny. We call them root bear float sea slugs, our favorite, because they're creamy brown color and um, they blend in well. They're really tiny, but they feed off of the baby barnacles. All right, let's go say hi to Claudine and see what she found. Oh, Kari just found an anemone with a stomach completely out. And that's it, that little white in the middle. Blob, there. yep. Okay. Why do they do that, Lisa? Um, to expel whatever they've just eaten. Uh -huh. But I don't see any remnants of matter. So in this case, who knows? What's <laughs> cool about anemones though, is in aggregated anemones, they live in colonies that are genetically identical. And they were reproduced for the most part by fission. So they become two individuals, two genetically identical individuals. Yes, they can send sperm and egg off, but these guys prefer to be clones of each other. And we'll find angry clones and they attack each other, to keep everybody in their respective colony. So let's go talk to Claudine and see all the cool sea slugs that she has found. So sea slugs are so cool. We call them nudibranchs because it sounds a little bit less icky, but they're just beautiful. So here's Claudine. Hey guys, how are you doing? Uh, Claudine, uh, first of all, I just wanted to let you know I've been a volunteer here now for 18 years, as long as Lisa's been here, and I am not a scientist. So if you guys ever want to have the best volunteer job ever, when, um, when we can come back out and visit our beaches, I would really encourage you to come volunteer because it's really cool because you get to see things like these beautiful creatures I have here in my tubs. Now we have a special collect, temporary collection permit at Haystack Rock that allows us to take these guys out um, for educational purposes to show you. So that's why we have them in these little tubs today, but we'll also go and look at them in their habitat. So what I have here is a sea slug. I think Kari was telling you that we call them nudibranchs because we don't think slug is a pretty enough name for them here. Um, so you guys have seen slugs in your garden. Well, these are slugs that we have out here in the tide poles. So the first slug I have here, we call it, this is a Janolis. And it's a beautiful slug. And you can see it's serrata, or it's little hair-like things. Um, they're kind of orange and white. And it's got these rhinospores here at the end, which almost look like kind of antennae. Can you see that, guys? So pretty. It's rhinophores, right? Right there. there. There's actually two of them then. There's a little little one guy, a little guy over there too. And then in this one, I have an opalescent nudibranch. It's really pretty too. It's bright orange and it's kind of got blue tips in there and it's rhinospores. You can see really well. So nudibranch, I always like to talk about adaptations. So adaptations are things that develop over time to help us live in our habitat. And all, if there's students watching, they know that habitat is where we live. So we as humans, we have adaptations. We have thumbs. And besides playing video games and using them for our phones, they also help us pick up things. These are things that we've developed over time to help us live in our habitat. So nudibranchs, and let's, let's go look at what they look like in their habitat. We've got a whole bunch here. Look, check, check this one guy out here, Kari. On the other side of the rock, I don't know if you can see. There. There he is. There we go. There's a beautiful. I don't like when I put the phone like that. There we go. One. So these guys are looking for food. Well, one tip I always give people when they're looking for creatures in their tide pools is to find out what they eat. When you find out what they eat, you will find out where they are. We have some more over here. Another opalescent right here. 
And then there's a whole bunch underneath the rock there. There's some there. We found about 20 this morning. And this is what they look like when they're out of the water. Let's take a look right there. There's a big one, and then there's a little tiny baby one right next to it. So like I said, um, hold on. Nudibranchs are really cool. And the opalescent is one of my favorites because it has a really cool adaptation that it's developed over time that allows it to eat these guys right here. It allows it to eat anemones. These are some aggregating anemones here. And anemones, uh, I think Lisa told you a little while ago, they are related to jellyfish. So in each one of their little tentacles here, they have stinging cells or nemastis. So what the, um, the opalescent does is it actually crawls up on that anemone and eats that tentacle and it swallows the nemastis whole and it puts it on its back. So now it has the same protection as that anemone. So that's an adaptation it has so it can live in its habitat. So when we're looking for opalescence, we look for hydroids, which um, are another uh, species here, and anemones, because a lot of times when you find those, you will find opalescence. Uh, same with genolus, genolus is rhizoan and hydroids. Um, and so you, we, want, we look for that type of food and we'll find them. Now we have lots of different species here of nudibranchs. Um, we have barnacle dorid species. Dorid ones are more flat. They don't have the hairs like our opalescence and our genolus. Um, and they eat what you think they eat. They eat barnacles. So what we do when we're looking for barnacle dorids is we look for their eggs. And usually when you find eggs, you find the barnacle dorids. And then we have a few other types of dorids here. We have sea lemons and uh, leopards and rostanga or red ones, and they eat a sponge. And so we have a lot of sponge here. Um, Uh-oh, just a second. It looks like there's an eagle coming in. Maybe he's gonna turn around. Eagles like to visit. They do. Oh, I can see him. He's leaving. The falcon is chasing it. Okay, back to nading. Claudia, I'm sorry. So, so sea lemons and reds and sea leopards, they eat sponge. Um, and their adaptation is they take from the sponge that they eat these little structures called spicules that sponge have for their protection, which are really sharp. Um, Kind of structures almost like glass so if somebody tries to eat, bite into a sponge it's like eating a bunch of glass so what the nudibranchs can do is they eat that sponge and they absorb those spicules in their body now they have that those same spicules so they have that same protection so it's all about the adaptations this is a pretty um, harsh habitat to live in your habitat changes every six hours with the tide so you have to really be flexible and you have to be able to adapt um, to all situations so I hope when you come, you find one of us here, volunteers or staff in the red jackets, and we will help you on the hunt for new ranks. They are about the coolest thing, I think, in the disciples. Thank you so much, Claudia. No problem. I think we should go talk about birds, but before we go, I want to show you guys something pretty cool. Lisa was talking about how the anemones clone themselves. Um, and this one right here is kind of in the middle of that process. So you can see it budding off. Um, and so this one will become two genetically identical twins um, and they'll keep, yeah they'll just keep dividing oh yeah that's a pretty good pretty well stretched one over here this one's like really close to splitting and how it's pulled really tight and oblong it's splitting itself in two all right, we're gonna walk over um, and we're gonna talk about some birds. Um, I'm gonna let you see Cannon Beach as we walk. Again, we're down here at Haystack Rock. Is it time to talk about birds or what do you wanna do? Uh, I wanted to show, talk about a hermit cub. Okay. And about sculpin because there's a whole pool of baby sculpin. Are the type of fish you find, um, and it's high and seven quietly, and there's a ginormous opalescent floating. They float upside down. Can you see the baby? 
Aha. School bin in that type ball. There's over 20 I'm hanging out. So. And school bins I, are really They're cool. skittish. So watch for a really fast moving. You can see, there's the new DeBronc right there swimming. That's how they swim upside down. Just fun fact. Um, homing device. <laughs> the skull bins, if they get trapped in a typo that doesn't belong to theirs, they can find it by smell. And they can change colors. They don't have instantaneous, like, say, a cephalopod with, like an octopus or a squid. But it takes several weeks for them to change color according because they adapt to their home typo. So if we notice, if you take a look at all those baby sculpins, what color are they? Let's see if I can right, find them. I don't know. Oh. Okay. Can you see? They're green. And why are they green? Because their home typo, the area they hang out in, has a lot of this ova or sea lettuce. So that's why they're green for camouflage. I don't know what this is, Lise. Is that a baby sculpin? It looks like, um... Yep, it's a baby that sculpin. Is? Oh, that might looks be like a, a shrimp. shrimp. That one's a shrimp. Look at that! <laughs> Hiding out with all the baby sculpin. It's nice camouflage in there. Bright green. And then we're going to talk about hermit crabs. And... I've never seen a green shrimp like that. And we also have other animals, such as the kelp isopods. They are, look like insects, and they can be anywhere. If the kelp's brown, they'll be brown. If they're by a lot of algae, they'll be bright green. So let's see. I had a hermit crab over here. Of course, when you want to find an animal, there's one, Lisa. Lisa. Oh, perfect. Okay, so check out the hermit crab in its natural environment. <gasps> there's two. Several. Oh. And perfect because one molted. And oh, remember, that's so these cool. are crabs. And as to grow larger, they have to shed their skin. So here, set it right there. This one has molted. No, he didn't get eaten by a rival, even though that's kind of what it looks like. This guy, and so as they grow larger, they have to borrow shells from snails. We have two individuals here. Do you see how I've scooped them up? We always want to scoop up the hermit crab, hold them like this, not running around to go show uh, your family member. You keep them low over the water so they don't fall out of their shell because they're not permanently attached. Guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna fall out. Luckily, this one is fake and it's sealed. So, but, oh. What is that? He just pooped. <laughs> <laughs> How about that, people? You saw it first here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a pretty good shell. Look at all those barnacles he's got on his shell there. Fancy. Ooh, look at this one. They're chasing each other around. Why so, would they do that, Lisa? Because they're territorial. And that could be a male because they grab onto the female and drag them along to make them say, you're mine. Um, and one of the important things, everybody, is when you are playing with the hermit crabs, please don't collect them in a bucket because you know what? They all live in neighborhoods just like we do. And if you put them in a big bucket all together, you're mixing neighborhoods up. And then you dump them off, you know, that's not very nice. That'd be like me coming and picking you up in a bus from your home, but dropping you off several blocks away. And so what does that mean? That means you might not be as protected. Yeah, you have this hard shell, but it's not your neighborhood. It's not your home. So remember, please don't collect things in buckets. It's very important. Um, and plus, because they live in neighborhoods, they may not always get along with each other. Just, that's the way it is. So, 
There's our hermit crabs. They borrow shells from deceased snails. They don't kill the snail. Um, they just find empty shells. So another reason here at Haystack Rock, we ask that you don't collect shells. It's not illegal, but it's recommended. Eagles coming in, everybody. Go in the peregrine falcon right after it. That little bird chasing it. So this is a bald eagle coming in. It's a predator. Um, the bald eagles actually eat seabirds, adult seabirds. A lot of times people think they're babies, but they like those adult common birds. Oh, guys, in the peregrine. There it is, you see that? There's the eagle, that big one. And then chasing right behind it is a peregrine falcon. And they're engaging in a territory battle right now. So you can see the gulls are all riled up. It's nesting season, so everybody's pretty protected, protective. Um, a lot of our MERS had already left, or you would have seen- Oh, right here. Thousands. Where? All over the needles. Oh, they're still back over there. The eagle hasn't spied those yet. Eagle went, Lisa. Oh, there it is. Where's the peregrine? Oh, right there. I don't see it. So the peregrine is the smaller sharp winged bird. And Kari's gonna talk about the peregrine, and we are really lucky because as Claudine pointed out, we have special permits. So we have permits for collecting animals out of the tide pools. Um, as a temporary basis, we have to put them back exactly where we find them. And um, in the case of um, our birds, we are super lucky we have a permit that allows us to have hearts and eggs because it's illegal to have anything um, related to a migratory bird. Um, we are just at 101 years of the Migratory Bird Act that protects all migratory birds from harm. So in our case, uh, we are lucky we have puffin eggs that you get to take a look at, pigeon guillemot eggs, black oyster catcher eggs, and what else? Um, oh, and the common mert. So in just a second, oh, the eagle's still on the north side. Still on the hunt. Can't quite find that common mert, can he? He needs to come from this side. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you wanna talk about any other tide pool stuff, Lise? Um, I think we're pretty much good um, for the most part. Remember, again, I can't reiterate this enough. Please always stay on the sand. Walking on the rock, um, it's called trampling, and it destroys the habitat here. And um, it's not about protecting the rocks themselves, it's about protecting the animals, the species that live on the rocks. And the shortest point isn't always in a straight line, so sometimes it's actually faster than we've timed this before with visitors. We walk all around the inner tidal to get to a location. So if you can't comfortably traverse it with sand only, maybe you need to stay away from that particular area. So in the meantime, let's head over to the um, the scope and this might not be the best time since the eagle's still up there but maybe we can go find a sea star until the birds come back in okay the wind's picking up a little bit so i hope you guys can all still hear us um we'll try to talk a little bit louder okay bear with us we're on the move um for those of you that weren't here at the beginning, we're the Haystack Rock Awareness Program here in Cannon Beach. We're going through our virtual field trip program. Um, for all of the hundreds of kids that didn't get to come here this year for their field trip. I'll let you see the rock as we walk because it's so pretty.
So as Lisa said, Haystack Rock is 235 feet tall. They think it was once over a thousand feet. So we call these the needles, these two. They think that thousand foot rock kind of filled in the difference between those two. And it all has since eroded away. So it's constantly eroding. The volcanic rock that hardened under the water is a little bit softer than the rock that hardened in the air. Um, so it erodes all the time. So here we are over at our bird scope. We set up our bird scope on the north side of Haystack Rock. If you see kind of set off to the side here. Um, and that's because our puffins nest up in the grass right there. Um, I don't see a single bird up there right now. Um, so I'll let you guys see some bird parts. How about that? Okay, so these are pictures. I got pictures of some of the birds that nest here every year. We have a really robust nesting colony. Um, seven or eight different species. This is a pelagic cormorant. We also have Brant's cormorants. They're going to have a really beautiful electric blue throat. Of course, everybody's favorite, the tufted puffin. Now notice our puffins have black bellies. The Atlantic puffin you see a lot of time has a white belly. So when people are bird watching here, they see these guys flying. They see their white belly and they think they saw a puffin. But this is actually a common myrrh. And those are the ones that the eagle likes to uh, snack on. This is a peregrine falcon that was chasing the eagle. This is, this picture was taken right here on the beach by Lisa. Um, and we have some of the different bird parts which are just kind of pretty cool. So um, we're gonna go through it really fast. We normally play a game, but um, I'm just gonna talk because you're not here with me. So puffins, tufted puffins, mate for life. They're migratory because they spend their winter out on the open ocean. Do you want to move me? Yeah. A little bit easier if Lisa holds the phone. I don't know if you can hear me. So I'm going to try to talk loud. So the puffins spend the winter out on the open ocean. Um, in late March, early April, they'll reunite with their mate uh, and together they'll come back to their nesting. Uh, territory. So they nest in the same spot every year. And like I said, it's up there in the grass. They're burrow nesters. So that means they nest in deep, deep holes. So they can dig burrows seven to eight feet deep into the rock. That's why a lot of times we're not too certain about how many puffins are on the rock at any given point because they bury themselves way down in a burrow. Sometimes you don't know. But every year they lay one single egg. this egg from say another puffin egg really um, and it weighs approximately the exact same size as a, as a sea battery as a sea battery um, so they have their puffling the puffling stays in the burrow um, and the parents will go to and from the burrow bringing the puffling fish and they actually um, will kind of entice the puffling to when it's time to leave the burrow by placing fish a little bit closer to the edge of the burrow one another. 
another. Um, it's safety in numbers. They pack all in there and they lay their eggs directly on the side of the cliff on the rock up there. Um, but like I was saying earlier, their favorite snack food for those eagles. So when the eagle comes in and they uh, leave the pour off the rock and they're flying around, if a bull doesn't come in and eat their eggs, which sometimes they do, they're pretty ornery. Um, when they come back, they're gonna know which egg is theirs from their neighbors because it's gonna have their color and it's gonna have their special mark. It's just like we have different fingerprints, they have different marks on their eggs. Um, this is a really, really special egg. This is a black oyster catcher egg. So these are our black oyster catchers. They're a shorebird. They're very charismatic. They're really important species. Um, that They are part of one of those citizen sites Margaret was talking about earlier. Um, Portland Audubon, actually Francis, um, is helping organize the black oyster catcher um, surveys. So that's pretty cool. Um, there's only three or four hundred left on the Oregon coast, um, which is a, a small number, but we're really concerned about their success in reproducing because they nest in really precarious spots. So um, our pair every year, they'll nest up. They can't hear. Okay, okay. our pair every year, um, they nest up in the saddle. So Lisa, can you show them where that do not enter sign is? Um, that's where our oyster catchers nest. Right there, right on the rocks. Um, so it's really a tricky place because the tide, um, it's accessible at low tide, people can walk up there. Um, so their eggs look like this. So I want you to picture if they're nesting on gravel, they don't build a nest, they just kind of make a little depression. Um, why would their egg look like this? What would be beneficial about an egg that looked like this on the rocks? Well, you're not here to answer, but I'll tell you. Because it looks like a little rock, so it's camouflaged. And it's really important that, um, that it is camouflaged because these eggs, um, you know, the gulls, there's just so many things that would love to come in and snatch these. So it just helps a little bit with their success rate. And Lisa, good news, saw the oyster catchers mating yesterday. Yes, so we're looking forward to um, another successful nesting season. They had one chick last year. Um, and just based off of how difficult their nesting process is, um, it's just so great when we get to successfully see them have a chick. Um, and they're maybe the most adorable things ever. Um, and then this belongs to our pigeon guillemot. Honestly, I, yeah, this is a cute little egg, but they, they are just crevice nesters. Um, they're adorable. They have a sweet little chirp that I love to hear. We also have some really cool skulls. And I bet you can tell what this one is. That's a puffin skull. You can see its big bill that it uses to dig out its burrow and hold fish. Something really cool about puffin is that they could carry like 10 to 30 fish or small squid or um, whatever they're eating in their bill at a time. And that's gonna save them a lot of time and energy when they have their little puffling to feed because they don't have to make as many trips back and forth to their burrow from the ocean because they, um, they have, it's called a denticle on their tongue. Um, if you guys are shark fans, that might sound familiar because denticles, sharks have them on their skin. They're like little ridges or spines. Well, puffin have them in their mouth. And if you think about like, uh, like a dish rack where you dry your dishes and it has its little slot, that's kind of how they stack their, their food up in their mouth. Um, and then this is a cormorant skull. Uh, I'm really sorry its brain fell out earlier. So I don't know if Lisa can show you that. I try to put it back in, but um, just so you know, bird brain, very small, <laughs> very small. <laughs> um, and then I want to show you the difference between these feet, because I think this is pretty neat. So here we have cormorant feet. They're our biggest bird, I believe, besides the eagle, of course, that nest here. Um, so they got these 
big webbed feet. And they can use these feet to dive down to up to 100 meters, I think. It's really, really incredible. Um, but those compared to these little puffin feet here, these are puffin feet. They're also webbed because they're seabirds. So any seabird is gonna have this webbing. Um, it's just like flippers when you swim. Um, but puffin have these sharp, sharp, sharp little claws. And that's gonna come in real handy when they're digging their burrows. But if you wanna talk about a sharp claw, <laughs> check out this. What is that? Look at the cool scales. This is a peregrine falcon talon. So peregrine falcons, the fastest animal on the planet, they can dive bomb 180, 200 miles an hour. Uh, and they got these pretty sharp weapons. So they're really good at what they do, hunting and killing. Uh, these are really disgusting, but Lisa loves them. <laughs> these are just so gross. This is a baby cormorant. It, this was an unsuccessful nest in the This was found in the surf. So cormorants will lay three or four eggs. This is a cormorant nest in their nest. And like I said, they're very large. So uh, three or four chicks is kind of a lot to have in the nest. Um, so the bully siblings, the bigger bullies, they'll just go ahead and kick the younger siblings out of the nest. Sometimes we find uh, dead cormorant chicks and that's just, just how it is. This is another one we found. Um, this one never hatched, I don't think, did it? Mm -hmm. No, so this is uh, a little bit earlier in the development process of the chick here. That, well, that one's really gross. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's go. Let's do it. Okay. All right. So you guys, when you come to Haystack Rock, it's just such a big rock that there's multiple places that you can go look at healthy tide pools. Um, and Margaret was talking about sea star wasting syndrome. We've lost to that virus 90% of our sea stars. Um, they've been on a viral lockdown for a little bit longer than we have, actually. The sea stars <laughs> on their virus lockdown. Yeah. Uh, let's make That's a good point. That is a good point. I might turn them in. So this is the uh, Haystack Rock. And when you're looking at the ocean on the west coast, the north's going to be to your right always. So on the north side of Haystack Rock, this is the best place that we have now to find sea stars. So our population is greatly reduced. But if you come to Haystack Rock, once all this stuff is over, um, you're going to want to come to the north side of the rock because this is where most of our sea stars are now. If you were here 10 years ago, uh, you would have seen hundreds of them and they would have been covering every rock here and they would have been down in their zone. Um, but that's just not how it is anymore. We don't have very many. So the few that we have, um, they're everywhere really, but this is the most densely um, populated sea star area that we can see. Oh yeah, so I'm sorry you guys, it's really windy. So I'm gonna try to talk a little bit louder. The wind's picking up. Um, we were talking about erosion earlier. Um, just a couple days ago, we wanna show you this piece that broke off. Um, and this is just so you know, when you come to Haystack Rock, um, that when we have ropes or signs up that say dangerous rockfall, we mean dangerous rockfall. This happened within the last month and a half because of all the juvenile barnacle recruitment. You can see 
the office clean little dots and they all be that has moved in. So that entire portion here was part of that smooth area. See and there are three other that rocks that were from part there. that went all the way to the top. So this has oh. been my favorite alcove for the last 18 years, kind of hiding out because of all the depressions in the rock. You'll find juvenile red rock bags. Lying chitons that we were talking about that feed off of the coral and the algae. Um, baby anemones, baby nudibranch, all these cool juvenile species all within this little alcove. So no longer, it's just part of life. Things fall apart <laughs> and things go away. So let's go back and start checking out all the sea stars. We have a few of the ochres here. And you can see they're purple. Surge. There's actually three right here. Oh, most important feature. <laughs> Never turn your back to the ocean. What am I doing right now? <laughs> my, no. my back is to the ocean. If you do get caught in a surge, very important. You're going to get wet. For your safety, stand so you have a greater, I don't know, what's that called? Stand? Breadth. Breadth. <laughs> to protect yourself as that wider, wider stance. Wider stance. There we go. Thank you. It's a little early. Uh, I'm shocked I haven't been at a loss for words earlier. And um, so make sure you're going to get wet. Just remember that. Ride it out this way. Don't try to run. If you try to run and that wave is going to overtake you, you are going to go down. That's really important, especially with small children. Kiddos. It's not going to protect you. But it is going to kill all these anemones. Yep. And algae and barnacles. And all the and other important things. And any baby snails that happen to be utilizing this as their habitat. All right. I think people want to see a sea star. I think they do too. And oh, we have, we don't want to Ew. <laughs> so these guys bite. They have a proboscis that they shoot out. Oh, he might not. Okay. They're kind of angry worms. <laughs> and to protect themselves, they shoot out this mouth part that bites you. And it's kind of scary. And every once in a while, I have a kid that comes up to me, hanging on to one of these worms. And then I tell them that they bite, and they immediately drop it. Don't pick them up at all. In this case, you see how much sand I have wrapped around the particular animal to protect it. So, and to protect me, of course, I don't want to get bit because they do hurt. Okay, enough of work. Sea stars. So, you can see this particular star is in the process of having breakfast and lunch and dinner and breakfast, and lunch, <laughs> and dinner. <laughs> so do you see how I was talking about they utilize all five of the rays to hold on? And what's cool about the ochre sea star, do you see those white markings on its back? Those white markings are pinchers. It's called petalous area. And you notice, well, first and foremost, a sea star does not move very far or very fast. And normally things that don't move have barnacles attached to them or algae. But you see how the sea star doesn't have any because they pinch all of that off of their back. And then here, I can get a good shot of these guys hanging out. And there's some babies hiding out in all of those little nooks and crannies. Oh, you're going to like this. If I can get safely in here without stepping on any animals. Look. Look at them all. These are purple. That's their common name, purple sea star, but they come in many colors. Orange, okay. blue, purple. And when they die, they're all the same color orange. They don't. They don't stay purple. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. 
if you guys didn't hear, when they die, they all turn orange, apparently. Fun fact from Lisa. Wait, what? as well as this orange sea star, the ochre here. Do you see the color of this guy? And then you see the color of that guy. It's kind of like how hair color varies with us. You can see that stance, how he's got his feet kind of like that, or they're not feet, but um, arms raised. raised. Thank you. That's, um, that's a feeding stance. Oh. The calcareous tubeworm has bloom here and a bloom there. Oh, so let me move out of the way. Oh, so we were showing you calcareous tubeworms earlier, and she was talking about the little plume that we couldn't see. Um, it's going to retract when my finger gets near it, but it's that little red part right there. If we can go find some babies. On our yeah, look, yeah, let's wrap it up with the North Polars. So we're, earlier we were talking about citizen science. Uh, Lisa and I come out here. We try to come out once a month to count our survey plot. Um, and this is our survey plot. These two boulders right here. We try to count every sea star that's on, on these boulders. We note its size. Um, the condition of its health. Um, and yeah, that's about it. That's a cute little one. Oh. I'd love to find a little, little one. Okay. It's been a while. Let's see if my eyes will... So, <laughs> the last few months, we haven't been able to complete our sea star survey. Um, and that is just due to the ocean. It's not always cooperative. So, we have to schedule them. We pick low tides. But sometimes we come out. And even though it's a low tide, the ocean is surging really strong. We can't get to our there we go. We got the baby. Here's baby. a little baby up in here. They kind of, they're little white. Sometimes people say they look like little snowflakes. Um, I can't get that one to go into focus though, but it's right there. Oh, right here. Oh, right here. And right here. Oh, they're everywhere. Okay, I'm back in sea star survey mode. <laughs> you see the little guy there? Oh, There's a little guy here. All right. I'm so gonna... that's going to conclude our field trip for today. So um, I hope there weren't too many technical difficulties. <laughs> um, We're six feet apart. We're trying to do our social <laughs> distancing. There we go. So I want to say a big thank you for joining us today. Um, send us any questions. Hopefully we'll have this posted on our website so you can come back and view it if you missed the entirety. But again, I can't reiterate enough um, how important this ecosystem is. And remember, we do have special rules here. And this is our 35th year as a Haystack Rock Awareness Program. So it's our big 35 year birthday this year. Oh yeah, see? Never turn your back to the ocean. Let's get food subject here. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you when all of this is said and done. Thanks guys. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>